Hello again, everyone. Um, just a second. Shir, Betty? Betty, okay. So we are preparing for the uh, second part, which is uh, our keynote uh, speaker. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Alejandro Armenelli, Armelini, sorry, uh, from the University of Portsmouth. Uh, Alejandro or Ale uh, is a professor and dean of di digital and distributed learning at the University of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom. His key role is to provide leadership in digital learning and learning innovation. Before joining Portsmouth, Ale was dean of learning and teaching at the University of Northampton where he was the strategic lead for the redesign of all programs for active blended learning. For the full uh, uh, short bio uh, of uh, Professor Armelilin, please see our book launch uh, webpage. And um, I welcome uh, Ale um, and we'll remove the pin and you are welcome to share your slide and make sure that we see you properly. Perfect, thank you very much, uh, Enet, and thank you colleagues for inviting me to this book launch. Um, uh, and um, uh, special thanks to Ishai for um, reaching out uh, on, on, on a topic that, uh, that we both know is of mutual interest and has been over a number of years. Uh, I will <laughs> share a few slides uh, with you. Hopefully you can see that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I have a little plan for you today, uh, which begins as follows. If this moves, that's the plan. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a few principles. Um, I will go on to the pre-COVID story, the ABL, the active blended learning story. <clears throat> then I'll move on to the pandemic period and the pivot to emergency remote teaching. Then I will um, briefly introduce the uh, university's, uh, Portsmouth University's uh, digital success plan for learning and teaching and how that links to blended and hybrid learning. And finally, I will uh, um, do a bit of um, uh, scenario imagining in, through uh, post-COVID scenarios, particularly in the context of my current university. <clears throat> so let's let's get started and 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 with a with a bit of a word of warning that not not all the principles are are, are set in stone. Of course, some of some of them will be controversial and may uh, not be applicable in all contexts. So let's get started with this. Um, first of all, uh, good pedagogic design and teaching practice mm, will stand a better chance of generating successful learning experiences. Sometimes <coughs> we, uh, we, we, we spend too much time and we over-focus on one of these two, uh, but the combination of them uh, stands a better chance of uh, generating successful learning experiences for our students. The second one <clears throat> is inspired on um, Bill Sinzer's book on writing well, uh, where the author says, in order to write well, you've got to rewrite. Well, in order to design well, you've got to redesign. Uh, and this iterative process is what leads to um, context sensitive uh, effective designs for learning. The next one is about engagement. And uh, as you probably know, uh, the literature has struggled over the years to define learner engagement. There are some useful definitions around, but the point here is not only about learner engagement, but also about tutor engagement and the link between the two. So visible, active and engaged tutors are likely to generate visible, active and engaged learners. <clears throat> uh, so this, this business of um, uh, uh, conceiving elements of the blend 
uh, as upload content disappear for a month and then come back. That, that is not likely, that doesn't show effective tutor engagement, nor is it likely to generate effective learner engagement. And that's what, that's the point that's being made here. The next one is about content versus context. Uh, and uh, this one is one that I've been uh, um, discussing and writing about for quite some time. <clears throat> and the point here is content is not king, context is. What really matters is what students and tutors do with content, how they do it, why they do it, and who they do it with, rather than the content itself. Bombarding learners with repositories of material uh, is not likely to do the trick, particularly for some profiles of learners. <clears throat> so again, context is king. The next principle is about good teaching and technology. And you'll see this is the first occurrence of the term technology in, in here. <clears throat> good teaching is a good starting point for meaningful, purposeful and innovative technology adoption. In other words, let's let's teach well and let's do that well first then think about other things but good teaching uh, is a significant and difficult concept in its own right uh, that should not be interfered with or should not be confused with or conflated with appropriate uses of technology that uh, that comes a little later and finally it's about terminology here. There are many things we can do with, in, on, and about learning, but we cannot deliver it. So when you hear terms like deliver learning, ask them, how on earth do you do that? Uh, whatever you do with learning, you cannot just deliver it. Deliver it, delivering is for Amazon, for the Royal Mail, but certainly not for learning and certainly not for teachers. So, from these principles, we've got some uh, follow up thoughts, one of which is uh, you might recognize this uh, an adapted version of, of, of the quote, but uh, those who can teach and those who can't just deliver content. And if we think of our own biographies as learners when we were at university, I'm sure we will remember a lot of people inspirational though they can be, hmm, whose only repertoire in the classroom or in the lecture theatre was delivering. So again, <clears throat> what makes teaching unique, what makes the teaching act uh, irreplicable and different from anything else that's happened before or anything that will happen subsequently, hmm, that uniqueness is characterised not by delivering the same content over and over again, but by creating unique learning opportunities or spaces from which learners cannot escape. Cannot escape. Yeah. Technology enhanced learning. Now somebody's opened up a microphone and I'm hearing myself. Now that's okay now. Um, technology enhanced learning, really? Well, I invite you colleagues to think about book enhanced learning pencil enabled learning and think about the book and, pen and the pencil as pretty sophisticated, powerful technologies. Why are we obsessed with technology enhanced learning? I would argue that the technology doesn't enhance learning. People do, teachers do, good teaching does, but not the tech in its own right. Which takes us to what we mean by active learning. <clears throat> and I'm using a pretty old quote from Bon and Eason here, uh, which uh, still informs some of our practice. Mm, we tend to often think of active learning as uh, the doing bit, mm, but sometimes we forget about the thinking bit. <clears throat> active learning involves both. Uh, the doing and the thinking about the things we do. The pre-COVID story 
<clears throat> the active blended learning story uh, unfolded at my previous university, the University of Northampton in the, in the East Midlands of England, uh, where I was Dean of Learning and Teaching <clears throat> and where we uh, put the entire portfolio of courses through a redesign process. And um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about that story. It took a good six years. Mm -hmm. It's a long process. It has to be a process that's scalable and you've got to bring your colleagues with you in that process, which is not always easy. <clears throat> so if I show you this, <clears throat> you will probably associate this with a fairly traditional model often termed the flipped classroom. Well, <clears throat> I invite you colleagues to be rather critical of this because this approach has a lot of problems. In fact, if you ask me, if you push me, I would say it doesn't work very well. Not only that, people get excited about the flipped classroom and they talk about it as if it was a new concept Actually, it isn't a new concept. It's only a couple of thousand years old. What has changed is the means and the tech that enable us to, to, to implement it. So forget this slide, because this doesn't, doesn't work very well. Let's look at something else. And I'm cutting a few corners here to get to my next point, which is uh, an alternative version of the slide. <clears throat> still linear, still blocky and rigid. So I'll fix that in a moment. But uh, rather than pre-session exposure to content on its own, which doesn't work very well, I already said a few things about content. <clears throat> let's focus on the scaffold that that content in conjunction with sense-making activities can provide. And you will notice that this slide does not have the word online on it. <clears throat> what it does say is in the classroom, outside the classroom, or if you like the lab or the field or the studio uh, or any other learning environment that, that, that is appropriate to your course. That scaffold, the combination of activities mm, with the content that enable the students to do those activities Mm, expanding into the real time session, mm, usually in our case, as a, as a campus based university that happens face to face. <clears throat> and that goes on to the consolidation and evaluation phase uh, outside the classroom, individually or in groups, and then it goes back to the start, but it is a little bit of a rigid model. So uh, as academics, we tend to like uh, slightly more fluid, uh, less blocky approaches. So the next slide tries to address that by presenting similar information in a slightly more cyclical format. Mm. Center stage, again, are the pre-session sense-making activities with embedded content and resources. So this is not about... So this is not about... about again, there's a... The again, the Again, this is this is about um, the echo continues. So if there is a microphone open in the room, can we mute that, please? Thank you. Um, there's a, there's there's a session, there's a pre-session set of activities with embedded content and resources, and that <coughs> that is what triggers uh, the, uh, the, the 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 set of in-class activities in real time which then moves on to the post-session consolidation and reflection. Now, this is all very good, uh, but similarly to the flipped classroom, people get also excited about, or have been excited over the last 20 years about blended learning and people define it as the combination of face-to-face -face and online learning. And that I ask really, well, this is a this is a end of 20th century, early 2000s definition. Things have moved on, and the book that we're talking about today does address this <clears throat> and introduces a range of uh, additional concepts around this. For now, I would invite you to move away from the restricted 
notion that blended learning is just the combination of face-to-face -face and online. I would argue that it's a lot more interesting than that, a lot more complex than that, and a lot of multi-layered than the simplistic, not simple, sim simplistic combination of face-to-face -face and online. It's got to, it's got to be better than that. We've got to do better than that. <clears throat> and this takes us into the hybrid territory uh, that the book deals with. Uh, and again, there are multiple views on this, depending on, on what and who you read. But in, uh, in a book I um, edited with uh, Brenda Padilla, uh, we have uh, a range of other dimensions of the blend, as we call them, where face-to-face -face and online is just one of them. But as you can see here, synchronous, asynchronous is another, the focus on academic content or employability is another, types of assessment is another, <coughs> guided uh, learning versus independent learning is another. All of these things constitute a much more complex blend uh, that will depend on multiple variables, not just the discipline or the type of university, but the profile of students and indeed the nature uh, of the learning environment as a whole. <clears throat> so blended learning can mean other things to other people. And one of the good things about having a definition mm, was, was that at my previous university, we all knew what we meant by active blended learning, as we called it. We meant this and nothing else. And we meant that. That is, that is what the university adopted as its published uh, definition of AVL. <clears throat> it is a pedagogical approach that combines sense-making activities with focused student interactions of the three types, learner, 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 tutor, learner content, mm -hmm. in appropriate learning settings in and outside uh, the usual classroom. Now, uh, you will note, no doubt, that uh, many of our colleagues are quite obsessed with learner content interaction. So give them content and wait for them to come back with learning. Well, the turning of input into intake is not quite as straightforward as that. Having a definition helped us a lot uh, at Northampton. <clears throat> How does that translate into hybrid learning spaces? Well, a uh, couple of pictures to illustrate the point. The university opened up its new Waterside campus in September 2018. And these two photos, just two out of many, illustrate some of the nature of, of, of those hybrid spaces. The picture in the, at the top shows <clears throat> five students and one tutor in an, in, in an open space. But you can also see the physical library in the background, and you can also see a standard teaching space uh, above. The integration of these spaces, formal and informal, tutor-led, student-led, physical, virtual, all of that constitutes the hybrid learning space that Northampton built uh, when it moved from 36 buildings to three. Now, that wasn't, of course, the only bit of that hybrid story. <clears throat> Activity-based working, which would be the topic of another conversation, uh, you will see that uh, on, on that slide, you will see the 1st of August, that was 2018, the first working day of the new campus. ABW meant that we had integrated hybrid spaces for staff as well as students. Nobody had an office. Not even the vice chancellor had an office. We all worked <clears throat> in open plan spaces with the integration of private areas, many private areas. You see one of them there uh, for confidential conversations of different sizes, uh, rooms for two, three, five, six, ten people mm, surrounding the, uh, the the open plan spaces. But the the, the point here was was really to 
to move from office-based environments. Mm. Uh, what will I do with my books? I hear you cry. Yes, all of that happened. All of those discussions took place. And that will be uh, a conversation we can have some other time. But the, the, the point I'm making is the hybrid learning space was not uh, an isolated story. It came together with the <clears throat> activity-based working uh, spaces on the new campus. As I moved to the University of Portsmouth, we uh, also have an institutional definition for what we call blended and connected learning, <clears throat> which is that. Um, blended and connected learning is our uh, Portsmouth instit institutional approach to learning and teaching, and the, it means those three things. Center stage, guess what, activities. Mm -hmm. Uh, place, time, synchronous, asynchronous, mode, individual, in teams, mm, and reason, mm, why, for the development and application of subject knowledge, professional and digital skills. So, we would say that a course is not taught in blended and connected or active blended learning if one of the following is true. Mm. <clears throat> and you are probably already guessing uh, what the answers, what the gaps are in that on that slide. It makes regular use <clears throat> of non-interactive lectures or the virtual learning environment or learning management system is primarily a content dump mm, or online activities just an add-on to face-to-face -face sessions, number three is critical, and there is no evidence of systematic enhancement. Regarding number three, a lot of colleagues, uh, particularly those who have not trained to teach, mm, uh, they, they get often very confused. They say things like, oh, my course runs in the classroom or in the lab or in the studio, uh, but I do a bit of, I put a bit of stuff online, so I tick the box of blended learning. Well, that's a, that's a big problem. That's what number three is about. <clears throat> In order to scale up, scale up the active blended learning, uh, and we have, we have a number of elements surrounding active blended learning, but in order to scale it up, one of the things that we have to bear in mind is building capacity. <clears throat> building capacity in things like learning design. And uh, there is plenty, plenty written about this. As you know, uh, at Northampton, we used uh, a model called um, Cairo, which is based on the Carpe Diem model at uh, Portsmouth, we've got a model called Enable, and the resources for that are freely available. <clears throat> Enable is, is, if you like, a hybrid between uh, Carpe Diem and uh, the ABC model at UCL. Uh, there are rather exciting uh, resources to be shared and looked at, and uh, which we are now using as we put the entire Portsmouth portfolio through the same redesign process as we did at Northampton. So things like that mm, uh, are resources we use uh, with, as we work with course teams and module teams uh, to redesign the entire, the entire academic offering. Some references in relation to active blended learning <clears throat> and blended and connected, we've got them there. Uh, again, multiple views on what constitutes a blend and that moving away from the simplistic face-to-face -face plus online is absolutely key. And this is a point that, in my opinion, the book makes really, really well. <clears throat> in pandemic, now moving, moving forward with the plan, <clears throat> uh, let me start with uh, the pivot to emergency remote teaching. Mm. Active blended learning turned out to be an unexpected 
and most welcome preparation for ERT. The uh, challenges we found at Northampton were minimal compared to the challenges that other universities faced, including my current one. And that's probably one of the reasons I am I have now moved to to, to really uh, take uh, move up a gear in terms of 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 uh, of teaching online, but also teaching in a in, in a hybrid environment. Emergency professional development, that means <clears throat> the CPD required by staff in order to teach in the, in the pandemic uh, driven environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we found out, not having done, not having done uh, appropriate CPD for this, not having done a previous transformation process as we did at Northampton with ABL uh, would have resulted uh, in a painful pivot, uh, as many colleagues at other institutions uh, found out um, as, as the pandemic unfolded. On my next slide, I apologize the bit on the right is in Spanish, but I'm sure you will get the point. 1970, it says on the right, uh, I will dictate my notes. 1990, I will give photocopies of my notes. 2010, I will put my notes on a PowerPoint. And 2019, I will share my notes on a drive, Google Drive or otherwise. Now, this teacher-centered, content-based approach is what I'm trying to illustrate here. Uh, the, the approach hasn't changed, the tech has, uh, but, but we really need to do better than that. <clears throat> The literature is, 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 is quite <laughs> unanimous on uh, the fact that many higher education tutors learn about teaching as they teach. Uh, very, relatively very few have done, have done teacher training courses. Uh, some have done other things like fellowships and they confuse uh, professional recognition with uh, a teaching qualification. When, when the shift to online happened, they learned uh, about online teaching practices as they were implementing them. And they saw emergency remote teaching as a sudden opportunity to learn about pedagogy, which is what triggered emergency professional development. <clears throat> let, me, let me show you a, a quick Venn diagram. <clears throat> when we uh, when we promote digital transformation in in my case or pedagogic transformation more more generally, <clears throat> we can think about uh, three areas of of change or three types of change: <clears throat> responsive, reactive, as the as it says on the tin, uh, quick, as a result of something that happened like a pandemic. <clears throat> developmental incremental, mm, slow burn, mm, longer lasting perhaps, bringing change within the culture, radical innovative, mm, a combination of, 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 if you like, left field ideas, uh, innovation mm, that, might, that might overlap with the other two. And I wanted to show you how they interact with each other. Primarily, primarily, what matters here is bringing niche enhancements into the mainstream. In other words, mainstreaming what works mm, to generate what we call the new business as usual. Now, <clears throat> as we look at the things that I've listed that I've mentioned in my presentation so far, you will no doubt notice that Active blended learning started off as a change within the culture, slow burn, hence developmental incremental, combined with radical innovative ideas that were radical or were innovative in the context of where they were conceived. <clears throat> and over time, as I said, in a period of, uh, of a number of years, uh, it moved from the periphery to the mainstream of that university to the point 
where ABL is the signature pedagogy of the university. In terms of emergency remote teaching and emergency professional development, <clears throat> that's where it sits at the moment, and it might move uh, out completely or further into the center, we, we shall see. <clears throat> and blended and connected, the intention, the intention, though not necessarily the position we find ourselves in at the moment, uh, is to move blended and connected as we did with ABL to the center, moving it from the periphery uh, to the mainstream. <clears throat> the future focused digital success plan at the University of Portsmouth takes on board all of this and, <clears throat> and looks at enhance, transform and inspire as our key verbs <clears throat> and has a mission which is, list, which is written there. <clears throat> it's based on a, a 6P framework. Uh, fortunately, Portsmouth also begins with a P, so that gives me seven uh, as the Portsmouth experience. And in here, <clears throat> you will find um, different elements, prospects or vision, graduates for life, portfolio, what, the, what courses we offer, and so on and so forth. One of them is place. Mm. Another one is, is principles for practice. Another is pedagogy for participation, which is where blended and connected is at the very uh, basis of the model. You will also notice that there is one reference to digital there. The plan <clears throat> has a number of projections into the future. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with the detail, but I wanted to highlight those bits. Mm. Pedagogic redesign as being key to our, to our projection, to our future years uh, at Portsmouth how we teach and academic support for staff. Mm. And you will notice that there is a rejection mm, of going back to normal. In other words, we do not want to go to pre-pandemic practices wholesale. We will certainly create, shape our new business as usual, mm but certainly not revert back uh, to practices that neither staff nor students want anymore. We want new, new practices that shape the future of learning for our students. The plan has five aims. And again, I'm not going to bore you with the detail of those. I'll just, I'll just say that aim one is about blended and connected and redesign. Uh, aim two is about assessment redesign. Aim three is about growing online learning provision as distance learning. Aim four is about <clears throat> growing interdisciplinary digital learning opportunities aligned to the research themes of the university. And aim five is about, in essence, learner analytics. Uh, but that, again, will take, will, will be a different conversation. It won't escape you colleagues that um, that part of the discussion these days and in the book uh, revolves around HyFlex. So uh, there's quite a few things to say about this. The purpose of today's presentation is not to not to um, explore this in, in detail or to do a critique of HyFlex, but there are a few things that we do need to say, as again, people get quite excited uh, about HyFlex. And by that, we mean real-time, mm, real-time teaching of face-to-face -face and remote students together. <clears throat> uh, uh, the position of the University of Portsmouth on this is quite clear. Uh, if you, if you had to do it, do it, but we suggest that you don't do it for a number of reasons, uh, partly based on practice, partly based on the existing research. Bear in mind that a lot of the current research uh, is based on, on uh, projects, on 
on, on studies that are very hard to replicate. Uh, so from the point of view of students, we believe that face-to-face -face cohorts and distance or not or remote cohorts are best taught separately. Uh, there is this, this idea that some authors put forward that um, the, the, the remote students want to build a community with the face-to-face -face students or vice versa. For us, that is a bit of a fantasy. We haven't seen evidence of, of that happening at all. Um, and particularly when we use physical artifacts, physical artifacts, that puts the remote students at a significant disadvantage. Uh, there are issues to do with staff attention, plenty of reports of staff members forgetting that there were remote students in the classroom as well. Um, significant issues with technology, significant uh, needs of support, and most of all, stress. Uh, teaching different groups, face-to-face -face and remote students, does generate a lot of stress for the staff member. Conducive to teacher-centeredness, another element of this, uh, uh, things tend to be easier uh, if you do the simple thing, stand up and spout. Uh, and that, that is another significant problem, not to mention cost, maintenance, training and so on. So there are a number of reasons why my university does not support HIFLIS unless the context absolutely requires it, hence necessity rather than choice. If we look at the Gartner hype cycle, you will notice, uh, colleagues, that here uh, in at the top is where high flex classrooms are. In other words, at the peak of inflated expectations. That isn't a coincidence. To conclude, before we get a bit of time for questions and discussion and expressions of horror, uh, a few post-COVID scenarios. Let's think before COVID first. Hmm? <clears throat> if we look at synchronicity and proximity, and by that I mean physical proximity, hmm, you've got that most campus-based universities uh, focus on the bottom left quadrant here. <clears throat> so traditional campus-based face-to-face provision and they explored uh, aspects of the other quadrants. That was pretty much the scenario pre-COVID. Now we have to think about what happens or what happened when COVID hit in March 2020 and how that informed subsequent practices. <clears throat> what I would suggest is that we are facing uh, scenarios of um, hybridity, as the book mentions, uh, that will be based on lower proximity and lower synchronicity. And I'm saying that universities may well have to do more things and do them better than they were doing them pre-COVID. So we are being dragged, as a campus-based university, we're being dragged in the direction of the arrow there, kind of away from the back to normal thing that we want obviously want to avoid. <clears throat> uh, we are being asked to do more things and to do better things for our learners and for our own staff. Mm -hmm. So we are absolutely not going to, to neglect the value of face-to-face of -face provision pretty much. We will continue to be a campus-based and a proud campus-based university, mm -hmm. but we are going to have to to consider alternatives, to consider new blends, to consider new hybrid spaces that enable us to do more things and do them better, particularly in lower proximity, lower synchronicity environments. That pretty much concludes the plan I had in mind for you today. And I would then, at this point, <clears throat> thank you for your attention, for your time, I will stop sharing and I will hand back to uh, Ishay and, and, and colleagues uh, back in Tel Aviv for mod the moderation of the Q&A. So back to you.
Thank you very much. It can clap more because we didn't have a... Uh, thank you for a most, most interesting, fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, a bit mind-blowing in Eastern parts for me as well. Uh, and I welcome uh, the audience from here and from a uh, distance to ask questions. And Ishai, you know, you saw the question if there are. Um, so. Yeah, if, if somebody wants to ask a question, even in Hebrew in the chat, uh, we can relay it. So, John, John, do you want to open your microphone and, and speak up? Hi, John Cook here. Um, got a chapter in the book, but I was um, a professor at, in particular London Met, where I worked for the senior management team there, doing something similar to yours. I thought your talk was great, actually. I think you've, you've dealt with a lot of things really well. Um, I was fascinated um, yeah, by bringing pedagogy and the changes COVID had together and the constraints of staff and students. So when I was uh, working with, with colleagues, the deputy vice chancellor, in fact, uh, at London Met, um, although I'm more into research these days. Um, and I, uh, you talk about avoiding going back to normal. And on slide 44, that's really useful about the tensions where you're being pulled. Uh, and um, I think what was under what my question is, is um, who's doing the pulling? Are the senior management team uh, pushing you or pulling you on board? Are the students wanting change? Because sometimes Heppy did a, a bit of research saying some students just want to go back to to face to face. So I just wanted to know in, in your context where where the pushing and pulling is coming from. Great, great question. Um, <clears throat> students, uh, when you when you ask them and when you when you talk about value for money and when they talk about value for money, they tend to say uh, we want uh, we want uh, our, our nine grand's worth. Of this, and that is uh, uh, that translates into going back to face to face. When you start doing that, which is what we did, uh, we brought a, our students back on campus. They started saying, "Well, actually, that's not really what we want," and that became clear through module evaluation forms uh, and through the NSS. Would you believe it? Uh, they started saying things like, "Well." It seems that you haven't learned from the pandemic. Uh, we don't want everything as it was before. Mm. So when you do an, an isolated piece of research into this, they might answer something. Uh, but when, when it comes to the practical side of it and they, they, they get called into a lecture at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning, they say something else. Uh, so uh, I think we need to find, we think we need to find a balance on that. As for other stakeholders, uh, the uh, uh, colleagues equally equally want a better blend. They want they want to do things in the way that works for their students as well as for themselves. And um, and we are not out of the woods yet. Uh, my mm -hmm. colleagues in, in in certainly at Portsmouth, uh, every single day we get a report of how many colleagues are down with COVID, and uh, yeah. and they they simply cannot be in a lecture theatre, they don't feel up to that because of because of the, the, the of the illness, but also because they they, they fear for the uh, for other people around them. So um, so they they can still do some of their work remotely as appropriate in their contexts. So uh, that that's a college, and then the senior management. Uh, senior management have uh, have taken a, in my experience an an, an, an evidence based view of this yeah. uh, and. Uh, and, and they are they are considering um, new hybrid working policies for new hybrid working hybrid learning approaches uh, assessment big issue with students who are afraid of coming back to a uh, particularly from overseas to a campus based environment so things are not going back to the 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 the, the, the pre covid scenario that some uh, might have suggested in their responses to, to many of these studies. Uh, things are rather more um, fluid than that. And, uh, and there's, uh, the, 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 there's quite a lot of road to, to go on before we come to a stable uh, position yeah. on this. Good, great, thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah. I think Tim had a question. Tim? Yes. Okay. So uh, maybe, yeah. Tim, Tim did you want to you... open your mic? Sure. Thanks very much, Ali. It was a great talk. I um, identify with a lot of the ideas that you put across. One of the questions I had was early on, you talked about um, really the heart of this being good teaching, which I've, I, I agree with. Um, I think we can really get bogged down in worrying about the situation and forgetting that, you know, when, when we know how to teach, we have a lot of resources to draw on. But I was just wondering, you, you sort of came to the position that high flex wasn't a good idea and I and for very good reasons. But I was wondering, can you overcome that by teachers being good at high flex or do you just think it's not really worth going down that road at all? A number of things to, to say about that. Uh, I started doing high flex myself uh, back in 1999. Uh, in those days, we had dedicated data lines even before ISDN. Uh, we had um, people in the room and people in remote locations uh, in rural in, in, in rural areas of my native country of Uruguay. Uh, we did that uh, with a lot of support at significant expense, but it was a, a huge experiment that was extraordinarily stressful uh, for me as a tutor and for the other tutors that were running other courses alongside me. Time passed and I was fortunate enough to explore a range of other technologies that make things a little easier, admittedly, uh, over the years. Uh, so here we, here we are 23 years later, uh, looking at HyFlex uh, as uh, facilitated by newer uh, tools and much better tools, of course, um, but it's still facing some of the same concerns. And um, uh, as I said, context dictates matters here. And it may well be that some disciplines and some tutors and some profile of students might find this particularly helpful in, in, in certain instances. I know of entire business schools that have kitted out uh, the classrooms with high flex equipment. Um, now, when it comes to doing tricky activities with physical artifacts in the classroom, the equivalent digital artifact never provides the same experience, never. And, uh, and, 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 and it, it, it is, it is hard to explain unless you actually experience it. But if you, I do invite colleagues to, to go through the, the experience of teaching in a high flex environment uh, and, uh, and, 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 and experience it for themselves. I have colleagues, for example, at a well known Russell Group University in the north of England, uh, in the School of Education there, who put themselves forward as uh, guinea pigs or as candidates, if you like, to explore high flex earlier on. In the pandemic. Uh, these are faculty of education people, trained teachers who know a thing or two about this. Uh, they are now telling me I regret putting my name forward for this. This is horrible. Uh, this is absolutely, it takes longer to prepare, but not only that, the experience is not the same. My learner, my learner's experience suffers, my own teaching experience suffers. We therefore invite people, even if that means um, adding um, uh, cost in terms of hours, uh, we invite people to split that, even if that involves reducing the duration of each session, teach the cohort separately. Uh, that generates a much more tailored experience to each of those uh, groups. Uh, you can plan, mm, you can plan a session appropriately for the on-campus students and for the remote students. And bear in mind, when, uh, when the pandemic hit, I was talking about emergency professional development, the, by far the most popular workshop we ran was about lesson planning. So shocking discovery. Teachers in higher education did not know the term lesson plan, right? So that alone tells you how, how challenging it is to have 
two constituencies of students uh, with different expectations that are being forced together in a real time session. Really, really hard for me, really hard for, for my students. There are some enthusiasts uh, that in some disciplines uh, will make it work. I have no, no, no doubt about that. But overall, I'm very, very hesitant. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's applause here in the room. Uh, yeah, yeah. This topic is a hot topic as well. Um, uh, I know that many institutions in Israel um, really uh, put together uh, classes upon classes with high, high flex. What is term high flex? Uh, so this is the issue by itself. And thank you very much for your uh, points into that as well. Uh, we really appreciate your time with us, uh, your fascinating talk. And I think we are about to go to a little break. So thank again uh, to uh, Professor Ale Armelini. <laughs>